afternoon. I want to welcome everybody today to our virtual panel event, The Glass Ceiling, Dated Metaphor or Current Reality. I'm moderator Tracy Murphy, Director of Athletics at Damon College. Thank you for joining us today. This is the eighth event of our ongoing series of live virtual panel discussions where we discuss current events, happenings, and hot topics. We welcome those who are joining us and thanks go out to our sponsor, the Graduate Programs at Damon College, for inspiring this event and these conversations. So to begin, I'd like to introduce our diverse panel. I will call on you, give, me, give us a little bit of background, your title, and let us know if you're a Damon alum. I think our audience would be interested to know. So let's start with Vi. Thank you, Tracy, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Vian Antrim. I am Senior Vice President and Associate Chief Nurse Executive for Cone Health in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I am an alum of David. Thank you, Vi. Glad to have you here. Erin? Hi, my name is Erin Bagwell. I am a filmmaker, blogger, and full-time caregiver to my two-year-old daughter, Ginny Rose. I'm the creator of Dream Girl, the documentary showcasing the stories of inspiring and ambitious female entrepreneurs that premiered at Obama's White House in 2016. And during the past two years, I've been working on a new short film called Year One about identity, postpartum depression, and my first year of motherhood. Year One will be released later this spring for Maternal Mental Health Week. And um, I'm not a Damon alum, but I did go to Sacred Heart, which is just down the street. So familiar with you guys and attended lots of events growing up. Glad to have you here, Erin. Mary Ellen. Pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, and <clears throat> I am a Damon alumni, probably um, the eldest of this group. Uh, I graduated in 70 in history and uh, went right into teaching. And I've had an interesting, and I would say a long career. I at one point was the superintendent of Hillsborough County Public Schools in Florida, the eighth largest district in the country. And then I was the um, commissioner of education for the New York State Education Department. And I've recently moved in and opened my own company and am working to address the issues of leadership and education. So this is a really pertinent panel. Thank you. Sue? Hi, everyone. I am very honored to be with all of you today. Um, my name is Sue Falsoni. I am the current owner of Structure and Function Education and Associate Professor in Athletic Training Programs at A.T. Still University. Uh, I am a Damon alum, graduated class of 1996 in physical therapy and um, was a distinguished alumni in 2009, I believe. Um, I was the uh, first female to hold the position as physical therapist, both physical therapist and then um, head athletic trainer for the LA Dodgers back in, uh, I think that was 2012. Um, but anyway, really excited to uh, participate in this panel with all these wonderful women today. I'm glad you're here today, Sue. Tiffany. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm humbled to be part of this panel this afternoon. Um, again, my name is Tiffany Hamilton. I am the Chief Diversity Officer um, of Damon College, and I'm also the Program Director of the Arthur Leaf Higher Education Opportunity Program. Great. Thank you. And Dragitza. Thanks, Tracy. Good afternoon from New York City. Uh, my name is Dragitza Mikavitsa. I am um, currently based at Save the Children in New York, sitting directly across from the UN Secretariat building. Um, I lead our work on um, the global campaign for adolescent girls and currently I'm following negotiations also timely for this discussion in the Commission on the Status of Women that takes place in March. Uh, so really, really looking forward to a dialogue with, um, as Sue said, with these wonderful women. Thank you for having me. I'm not a Damon alum, but uh, Damon has a special place in my heart. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. I am so excited to be um, having these discussions with you today. So before we begin, I want to point out that we are aware of privilege of being employed right now in the context of our discussions about work and leadership. This has been a very difficult time for many people across the country, and the data shows that the detrimental effects of the COVID-19 pandemic are disproportionately affecting women. 
especially women of color and those that are mothers. Record numbers of women are leaving the workforce. That's why we want to be mindful of our privileges during this discussion. Additionally, it is crucial that our discussion be inclusive of the intersectionality of womanhood. In our conversations today, in our professions and in our communities, we recognize that no two women are the same. Lived experiences, identities, and types of privileges vary. And as such, so much are, so must our understanding. So the idea of this program is to have a discussion. Although I will call on someone, please don't hesitate to uh, get, in, get engaged with the conversation panelists. So as everybody knows, March is Women's History Month. So to kick it off, and in our first question, I'm gonna drop a little history. So Marilyn Loden is actually the woman who's, who's credited with coining the phrase glass ceiling. So she was in a, she was at a, dirt, a panel discussion in 1978 for a women's exposition in New York City. She stated that it seemed to her there was an invisible barrier to advancement that people didn't recognize. She called it a glass ceiling. In 2013, Peter Northhouse noted that a glass ceiling is a barrier that often prevents women from reaching higher status jobs. Even in female dominated occupations, men appear to ride the glass escalator, a fast track to advanced positions. So starting with you, Tiffany, can you talk about the glass ceiling and how these barriers impacted your career path or leadership opportunities? Sure, um, I'm excited to start the conversation. I'm um, gonna thank you for the question. Um, I'm gonna be a little honest and transparent here um, and tell you what I thought about when I was invited to the conversation, right? I said, what could I contribute? Um, what can I say that might be impactful or poignant? Um, and then I had to take a little bit of a U-turn on my brief moment of imposter syndrome um, and acknowledge that all experiences matter, whether they're good, they're bad, or they're ugly. So when I think about glass ceilings and those glass elevators and even more so um, the sticky floors um, in my career, I think about how the upward mobility of my colleagues made me feel as a person and a professional. Um, how many times I felt less than underqualified and sometimes even stuck. Um, but as I've grown uh, in my profession and have surrounded myself with women mentors and allies, and I've learned more about the systematic oppressive structures that exist, um, I now know that it, it was not me. It, it's not that I was unworthy of position. Sometimes it was that positions might have been unworthy of me. Um, it's not always easy to, um, to stand in our truth in that way, especially when we consider how, how we work and how we tend to identify ourselves um, through our careers. However, what, we, uh, what has freed me the most, I think, is that I know now know um, through my experiences and through my relationships and um, is that while um, we, we are existing in some systems right now that were created by men to benefit men, um, those systems will be brought down by women to benefit everyone. Um, and uh, I think that's really important for us to kind of hold on to as we kind of journey through some challenges that we might face in our careers. Um, and as we, um, as we uh, as women in general kind of struggle to be ha have some upward mobility in their careers. Now, all of this is to be considered, right, that we're talking generally, right, about kind of normalized definitions of women. Um, but when you throw in race and sexual gender identity, um, physical or intellectual abilities, we see even greater disproportion in terms of career ascension. So. Full circle, right? Now, I, I have been fortunate enough to be a woman who's been able to kind of um, escalate in her career. Um, and I've reached a ceiling, I think, that many might not have. I'm fortunate to work in an industry that is not male-dominated. Um, at our institution right now, we're about 77% women in faculty and administration. So, um, But even in those kind of contexts, it's really important as a leader um, to embrace my, my duty and acknowledge the fact that when you break the grass, glass ceiling, it shatters, right? What happens to the glass that falls, right? My responsibility is to make sure that I am identifying um, and dismantling the discriminatory, bar discriminatory barriers that prevent people who are stuck on the floor from having the mobility that I was able to have. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Erin, let me ask you, in your opinion, do you think women and men lead differently? That's such a good question. Um, 
I've been actually thinking a lot about this because I think that if you would have asked me a year ago, I would have talked about the power of vulnerability and I would have talked about peer mentorship, but this year the pandemic has changed everything for women. According to the US Bureau of Statistics and Labor, we lost over 2 million women in the workforce. A disproportionate number of those are women of color. And in one year, we've erased 30 years of progress. And women like myself have had to put our careers on hold to focus on childcare. And so when I think about the core differences between being a male and a female leader, I think about the invisible responsibilities that women carry with them to the workplace. I think about the inequity of the labor at home. I think about how women and especially women of color are paid less than men. I think about how mothers are paid even less than their female coworkers without children. And I think about how we are the only industrialized nation in the world that does not have a national paid maternity leave policy. And so I think in order for us to fully embrace women in leadership, we need to start having these conversations of what it looks like at home. And I think this needs to be one of the central focuses um, when we talk about and think about how we're gonna uplift women in the future. Thank you, well said, <laughs> very well said. I appreciate that. Vi, you currently lead efforts to further develop nurse workforces. I suspect that your experiences have identified you as a strong mentor. To what extent does having high quality connections as a mentor influence someone's ability to advance? So I would say this, in my experience for my career ascension and I have done every job that there is in nursing. I started as an uncertified nurse's aide. I was an LPN, an RN, uh, nursing supervisor, manager, right on up the line. Um, it is about relationships. And the higher up you go, the more people you help serve and the greater impact that you help have. And part of the reach of your impact is when you get there, uh, teaching others how to get there. And I think one of the things that I've had the good fortune to do over the course of my career is to be able to give people opportunities, um, in particular, people who may not have gotten those opportunities otherwise. Um, and so I always look for who's the most qualified, who's going to do the best job and um, really work to put people in positions to do that. When I see someone and, and see talent in them, I don't wait for them to engage me, right? I go and I actively engage them and I start asking them, planting seeds, what are you thinking about for your future? What does your trajectory look like? What are you interested in? Let's spend some time talking about that. And then once I have a better understanding of who they are and what they hope to accomplish, uh, really looking for opportunities to put people on committees, have them help lead projects, give them visibility. I am happy to be the person that brings your name up in the room when you're not there. And I think as women, we really need to not only, it's not enough to mentor and coach, we really have to be sponsors and advocates and allies for each other. Um, and I, I think that's crucial. And I think um, having a strong network is important, right? We talked about how a lot of men sit in some of the highest ranking positions. So how do we position ourselves to be able to move into some of those positions? And some of that is through results, but a lot of that is through dialogue, it's through networking, um, it's through figuring out what the needs are and how you might be able to help fill that gap. There have been many times over the course of my career in my own development where I took on additional projects or additional initiatives that didn't necessarily fall into my current job. However, they were great opportunities for me to demonstrate what I could do. And I think, um, you know, men sometimes can be promoted on potential. 
right? And as women and anyone of color, I think it, this works out the same either way, you really get promoted based on performance. And so it's really important for people to have an opportunity to perform so people can see what, they're, what they can do. Um, so for me, that I think that's been a hallmark, uh, a legacy of my career thus far. I did accounting before I did nursing. And, um, you know, throughout my entire career, I've been a nurse for 25 years now. Um, that has been something that I have always tried to do is to find people's talent. And even if you help people grow within the context of their current role, because they're happy in their current role, and that's what they want to do. People are hungry for growth opportunities. They're hungry for somebody to take an interest in them, um, to believe in them, and to help them envision a future and a possibility that maybe they can't see for themselves right now. So I think as leaders, um, we have the opportunity to help paint that picture for people and to help them see themselves in a way that they might not currently and we should leverage everything within us to help people grow and expand their boundaries, both personally and professionally. I truly believe that any time invested in someone is never wasted. Tiffany, did you have something you wanted to add? I did. Just a few things. I loved everything um, that you said, Vi. I do want to chime in and say I also was in accounting before I in my in my current career. <laughs> so it's not funny how you can have these kind of transitions in your life. But the reason why I, I work in higher education now is because um, as an accounting manager um, at a bank, I I felt like I didn't have the opportunity to mentor in the way that I wanted to mentor, um, and that um, there wasn't a lot of recognition of what the power dynamic and power structures look like in terms of mentoring. So when you say it's our responsibility as leaders to go out and advocate on behalf of and bring people into the rooms that they're not currently in, it's so important because we can't assume that just because someone has ambition and desires um, to ascend and to grow in their, within their profession, that they have the ability and privilege to do that. Um, so it really is important for us to be mindful of um, access to social equity, right? Um, who do people know? These networks don't just pop up, right? <laughs> they, they have to be created um, and, and it's difficult for some. So those are some of the examples of that sticky floor I was talking about, right? The structures and the systems that are in place that that's always prevent people from being able to move forward um, and, uh, and move upward um, without any kind of help in, in, in modeling. So I love what you were saying about how you do your work because I think it's really important. Thank you, Tiffany. You know, Vi, I, I will add to, to, to what you said as well. Um, you, you put it very well about our responsibility as women in, in roles, no matter what the role is. It's our responsibility to lift as we rise. And in order for other women to be successful, it really does take all of us to help. And I think you, you said it very well. And I thank you very much. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, you know, Sue, we're seeing we're seeing more and more women um, taking on roles in a professional sports uh, profession that really does seem to be historically held by men. Uh, for example, uh, we saw female uh, women women who were officials during the NFL Super Bowl. For example, we are seeing uh, women being hired as pitching coaches for Major League Baseball. And even here in our own Buffalo, Kim Pagula is a team owner. She's in the front office, and, and uh, you, you know, those things are, things are changing. Um, you're a consultant for sports organizations. I'm just curious, how might you address, when you go in and consult, uh, a culture that may not indicate a capacity for women? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a culture culture is tough to build, right? It's something that everyone who owns a business or anyone who works for another company, culture is sort of this thing that's always talked about. And it's so tangible and yet it's fairly intangible because there's not a blueprint to how do you build culture, whatever that means with, within your organization. And so, you know, I think that looking past at my opportunities that I've been given in uh, areas that have historically been held by men, I was given those opportunities 
by men because there weren't any women to give those opportunities. And I think that a that that opportunity as the first female head athletic trainer did come from the LA Dodgers and that that organization has as a whole has an incredible history of being the first when you look back at you know Jackie Robinson and when you look back at uh, Fernando Venezuela who was the the first um 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 uh, Hispanic pitcher, pitcher, and you know, you look back at the Dodgers as an organization. Their culture was to break barriers and to bring people who did not look like everybody else um, into their mix. And so, I think historically, that organization did have a culture of just doing things differently. And I think that with that, the men that gave me that opportunity also helped from a cultural standpoint because I can't, as the only female, couldn't walk in there and change the culture. I needed support and I needed help. And those men really did that. So anytime there was something that was said that maybe wasn't appropriate or wasn't whatever, I didn't necessarily have to be the one that was always standing up for myself. They policed that for me. Um, and I needed to have that support. And then on, so I think one from a, a creating that culture standpoint, one, it's, it's really having everybody on board to support that person who maybe does look a bit different than other people. And then two, I also gave a lot of respect in order to get respect. I think it would have been a huge mistake for me to walk into that room and demand that everybody in the room change because I, I opened the door and, and, and walked, walked inside. And so, you know, I really offered a lot of grace to people when they were unsure of what to say or what to do or how to deal with something in the room um, and just offered a lot of grace, which I think gave me grace in return. And I respected their space, um, which I think allowed them to respect my space as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think a little bit of what can I control? Um, not that we can always control how the culture ends up playing out, but those were just some of the things that I did. I really tried to give that respect in hopes um, that I would get respect in return. Now it worked out for me. And I know it doesn't always work out for everybody. You can give all the respect you want and you still don't get the respect back. So I understand that I was lucky to have that, uh, to have that experience. And that's not everybody's experience, but um, you know, the culture is shifting in professional sports. It is changing and we have to build upon that momentum. And it's really about getting our male counterpart support to really do that for us and with us really. Thank you. You know, I have a question, uh, a follow up, I guess. You know, how do we find how do we find the companies with the culture? Does that mean that we have to go online and look up the board of directors? Do we have to go up and look at front offices? Do we how do we know that that's the job that will be the most will provide us the best opportunity? I mean, is that the best way for us to do the research? I mean, or do we I mean, how do you know that you're going to walk into the good culture? Even, you know, how do you know? Yeah, we, we, you definitely don't. I would love if I got some um, insight there. Um, yeah, I, I always encourage women to look at who have they hired in the past? What does their front office look like? Um, you know, are there different representations on their board of directors. If there's not, then you might be banging your head against a wall that just might not be worth your headache, um, depending on the situation. And I have just, I've always looked at, at those things at board of directors, at who's at the leadership table. And um, not that I've not taken positions, I've definitely taken positions that, that were, I was the only female and it was a, a whole bunch of, of white men at the table. And I still walked in the door and, and and sat myself down, but I know that always doesn't happen. Sometimes you do need um, you do need to be different into those into those situations. But at the same time, yeah, I think looking at their leadership, looking at their board of directors, looking who leads the company, and do they have a history of diversity, or are they at least attempting to make that change? And I and I think that's that's really important um, because. I, you know, I just kind of take the attitude, I may not change everybody and I may not change every organization. So where can I start? Where can I help? And sort of sometimes chipping away at those organizations that already have that growth mindset um, may make things a little bit easier than trying to, to start with the organization that really has no desire to change, which is just going to cause me a lot of stress and strife. 
Right. Vi, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say, Sue, I wanted to double click on your point about men being able to serve as advocates, because I've had several over the course of my career. Um, and in fact, it was a man who gave me my first spot on a board of directors. So, um, you know, sometimes they reach in, uh, they saw there were several too, that they were both my chief operating officers, saw something in me very early on and kind of sat down with me and said, hey, you've got bigger things in your future. What are you looking to do? Um, so I just want to, I don't want us to um, negate that fact. There are men out there that will be great and strong advocates for women on our behalf. And in terms of finding an organization, I would say this much. Um, I think you can evaluate and assess a lot of things. I think Sue gave some great feedback in terms of looking at the board of directors and also the executive leadership team to see what that composition looks like. It'll give you a good idea. And especially if you compare that to the demographics of the community that the organization is in and is it representative of that community. Um, but outside of that, more than anything, I think as women, we have to embrace the power and influence that we have and not be intimidated when there isn't uh, somebody that's currently there. Somebody has to be the trailblazer and why not us? Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, listen, we're gonna take a really quick break uh, so that you guys can, uh, our audience can uh, see a message from our Damon's Graduate Studies. So we'll be right back. Thank you. At Damon College, we strive to help every student reach their educational and professional goals. With exceptional resources and one-of-a-kind learning experiences, our graduate and professional programs will put you on the right path to career success. Our graduate programs include applied behavior analysis, education, nursing, social work, and more. Seven of our 11 graduate programs are open to any undergraduate major. Explore our graduate programs today by visiting damon.edu slash graduate. We're back. Glad to see everybody. Okay, here we go. Question, next question up. They say effective mentorship are key to opportunities. I can tell you that when I decided to um, advance in my career path as an athletic director, um, I had a very difficult time finding female mentors. In fact, in my field as of today, which is collegiate sports administration, female athletic directors only make up 25% of the 1,208 opportunities that exist in NCAA institutions. So when I was looking for a mentor and I was looking for a particular a woman, um, it, it, it was difficult. Uh, Dragica, what barriers have you encountered in finding mentors? Thank you so much for the for the question, Tracy. I do want to put a disclaimer on my responsive responses, which will be subjective. And like Tiffany said, I also come from a female dominated field. For instance, my graduate program at the new school uh, for a master's in international affairs was 70 percent women and 30 percent men. And I believe that that figure is pretty true across the humanitarian or development and aid sector. Um, as, we, as we speak right now. And that's really the, the perspective that I'm coming from. I'm also coming from a privileged position of being an advocate day to day for um, improving the situation of women and girls um, in particular in crisis situations. One of the topics that I advocate on at the United Nations is ending child early and forced marriage. So it's a part of my daily mindset, thinking about barriers to women's and girls' participation. And in fact, um, I mentioned in my intro, the negotiations that are happening politically here in New York right now for the Commission on the Status of Women, that's the theme this year. And believe it or not, um, there are member states uh, who are still not convinced that women and girls have agency, and in particular, young women and adolescent girls. So that's, uh, in my view, a very outdated uh, way of looking at things. Now, with this said, I'm in a, a female-led uh, INGO, uh, international organization that has 28,000 around the world in 120 countries working as a movement uh, for child rights. So. 
Uh, however, <laughs> with, with the female leader at the helm of the organization and such a powerful movement, uh, we still have a lot of senior level positions filled by white European men. So needless to say, for the last few years, we've put ourselves hard to work in developing um, a gender policy, gender equality policy, a diversity policy. And just last month, we adopted our first localization policy. I think one of my colleagues here raised the issue of representation and um, really looking at what that means. And for, again, a powerful organization like mine that's uh, so far stretched uh, across the world, I think being representative is also a really important aspect of, of things. Now, um, in terms of barriers, in my personal experience, I've, I've only ever actually worked for female bosses, with the exception of one short uh, consultancy of five weeks where I, where I worked with, with a male uh, boss. But what I witnessed is actually a lack of um, perhaps capacity to really manage people in a mentoring kind of sense and also um, leadership skills. I think for the nonprofit sector, I can only speak for, for that because I haven't worked in the corporate sector throughout my career so far at all. Um, we do lack for um, really building up those capacities, management, leadership skills. Uh, so we do, I, I have to say, um, so far, I'm, I've yet to see those examples and, and role models. And also, we're really bad at talent retention, so that's a, another conversation for another time. But I was lucky that in my previous um, organization, I was able to identify a mentor, a woman who's a, a child rights advocacy star who happened to synergetically identify me as perhaps uh, a bit of a legacy um, potentially, and for me to look at her career track and, and really with respect, try to emulate that and see a vision of where I'm headed in terms of my career aspirations. Uh, she's been a, a longtime advocate at Human Rights Watch on, on child rights. But I, um, I think it was Vi who, who spoke about the idea of network. I think uh, I'm a, an advocate and a networker by nature and profession. So it isn't enough to say to people that we give career advice to, to go out and network. It's important to institutionalize spaces and give structures. Um, for instance, the my organization has a women's network that has a sort of a matching system for, for mentorship within the organization. So older women or more senior women to, to mentor younger women. And, and so I've been able to find a mentor within Save the Children as well to help guide me through the trajectory of my career here. Um, in addition to having identified a mentor more broadly outside. Um, and in terms of my, so those, those sort of institutions and spaces are really, really crucial in my view. And then in terms of um, my mentoring style, in all of the hiring that I do, I do really look at hiring young women of diverse backgrounds. Um, I recently um, managed someone um, for, for a few months full time who in her final email <laughs> or evaluation of me said that she really saw me as a role model. And in her words, she said, you're never afraid to speak your mind or to put your foot down when needed. For me, uh, this is a little bit more the intangible, but, but to me, leading by example is really important. Being an authentic person who really has her own voice and can teach others to discover theirs is really important. In addition to creating uh, environments where people feel supported to learn, um, receive constructive feedback and, and, you know, just share in the enthusiasm of the work that I do. That's the most exciting thing to me when I know that someone is interested and curious and keen and cultivating that uh, enthusiasm and potential is, is really important. I could go on forever about this topic. So I will stop there and, and hand it back to you, Tracy. Thank you. Well, thank you. You have a lot to share. And I think you've had some really uh, unique experiences and, and uh, that experience is, is good for us to hear that, um, you know, Aaron, would you like to add something to our discussion? Yeah, for sure. I just wanted to second the, this idea of peer mentorship being so crucial and so important because um, I am part of um, amazing networking and communal groups that we couldn't find mentors. I, I couldn't find, you know, a Hollywood film producer to to help me on my journey. And so um, 
uh, you know, being able to look to your friends, being able to look to people in your community. I'm part of a lot uh, of really incredible network where if you have a question, um, you ask it to a group of like 20 women, it's like a Google group, and we all respond with answers or, you know, ideas or comments, suggestions. Um, and I think it's really important that you know, sometimes just because you can't get access to it doesn't mean you can't find it kind of within your community. Um, the other thing I will say is I felt like as a young woman, like coming right out of college, I became like obsessed with finding a mentor. Um, and I think I wish that someone would have told me that it doesn't need to be like so serious. Um, we can find amazing women who have experience in our networks and, you know, ask them a question once a quarter, you know, it doesn't have to be super formal. You don't have to go to coffee every day. Um, you don't need somebody to hold your hand. Um, if you find somebody like that, that's great. Um, so, but I, I think that our, our idea of mentorship, I think can become a little bit more, can be casual at times and that's okay too. I think it's whatever you need in your career to kind of take that next step. Thank you so much, Erin. Uh, great experiences. We have a question from our audience and since we're on the conversation, we're on the topic of mentorship, this is an opportunity for all of us to provide some assistance. So the question is, can we speak to the burden of emotional labor at work? And how can we be mindful of it or deal with it? Who would like to take a stab at that? I'll go first. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are, um, there are folks who experience a, a bit more labor in terms of um, trying to solidify their, their place and their position and create um, uh, a, a place for themselves within organizations and have some mobility and to be taken seriously and to be taken worthy. Um, we have to continue to talk to, to, to bring to the forefront our most marginalized people, right? Our most marginalized women. Um, and in, in, in spaces where, where women um, are intersecting these margins, right? Where it's not simply their womanhood that is a barrier to them, but their identity and, and, you know, caregivers and pandemics and how that impacts people. You know, there's all these things that intersect. What are we, what are we, uh, how are we supporting those, those, those women and those people um, in, in terms of making sure that they're safe and they're okay and they're cared for um, and that we aren't expecting them to carry loads that aren't theirs to carry, you know? Um, women did not uh, marginalize themselves, right? Black women did not marginalize themselves, but are expected to lead uh, efforts to break down these barriers and lead efforts to make these changes in these organizations and these institutions. Um, that's the expectation, right? Um, so when we think about mentors, right, we're, we're talking about our leaders and top down, what's happening in the glass falls and who's stuck on the floors. Um, I think it is so, so, so important for us to remember that it's not the people who are stuck on the floor's responsibility to unstuck themselves. You know, we got to clean that floor up. Who's mopping it up? Who's building new stairs? Who is um, managing who gets on the elevators, right? It should not be the, the, the folks who have been marginalized and who are experiencing severe oppression, keep them in places that is, that's um, inequitable um, and unfair. Thank you, Tiffany. Sue? Yeah, Tiffany, I love some of your analogies. They're fabulous. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, just to sort of echo that, I think too, if, if you are in a position of leadership, I know for me, owning a business and sort of being in those positions wasn't natural for me. You know, I, I went to school to be a healthcare worker. And so, you know, owning a business or being a manager, or sort of being in charge of others' work habits um, was something that I had to learn along the way. And luckily I had some great mentors to help me learn some leadership skills. And, and I would do a lot of reading. And, and one author in particular um, is an author named Patrick Lencioni. And he has some really fantastic business leadership books um, that are super easy to read. And, and one of the first books I ever read from him were Three Signs of a Miserable Job, which um, I thought, well, I'm gonna read that book. And you know, sure enough, one, one of the things is when people feel really anonymous at their workplace. And when people, 
people, you know, the, the people who they work for don't really know them as a human. And so I really took that part of the book to heart. And I thought, okay, that's at least one thing I can do is make people feel like I see them beyond the workplace. And so I always have made it a point since to start or end um, a, a conversation with people that I technically am responsible for, for in the workplace, you know, like, hey, how is, you know, how are your kiddos doing? Or how's the new house? Or, you know, just something personal to make sure that I recognize and that they recognize that I recognize there's more to them as a human than being an employee uh, in my world. And so that has really, for me, as a as someone who has been in a position of leadership seems to have gone a long way. It helps me. It helps me to get to know the people that I'm, that I'm working with. And um, I think the feedback would be that it helps them um, as well, because at least I recognize, gosh, you're going through a really difficult time right now. We all can't be on our A game hundred percent of the time. Um, You know, we've all been there and there's a lots of, lots of different struggles. So just, I think taking that minute or five minutes, to just check in with your people as, as a human will go a long way. Thank you, Sue. Mary Ellen, you're in a field of developing leaders. Tell us a little bit about your experiences crushing the glass ceiling and how perhaps you use those experiences in leadership development. Sorry, there's so many things that um, have been said today that um, I'm like, yes, yay, yeah, I, I went through that, right? I know exactly what they were feeling when they heard that because I was there. Um, one of the things I think people need to understand in education, you know, we think, though, there's lots of women in education. There, there is, you know, 76% of the people in education are women in all different positions, Um 52% of them are principals, primarily in elementary schools, and uh, 76% are um, administrators in central office. However, the telling tale and statistic on that is that in 2000, only 13% were superintendents. So a huge field of women and a relatively low percentage of leaders of those organizations. Now the organizations are very different in size. Um, When you talk about the number of school districts in this country, there are over 14,000 and some of them are, you know, well over a million students and then others are um, a hundred students. So you have a wide variety of of what you're really looking at in terms of organizations. However, just the fact that uh, only 13% were superintendents in 2000, and now I will say that has grown and in 2017, it's approximately 25% are females that are in superintendent positions. And I would say to you, and that coincides with my career and the pathway that I had, Um, I was one of those that would be in that early number, right? So um, in 2005, I was in a position where um, I was an administrator and a deputy superintendent doing jobs that, um, you know, some women had not been traditional women. Um, I was in Florida, which... um, Uh, For those of you, and I don't know that this has come up, but geographically, there are areas in this country that have higher percentages of male-dominated companies and organizations rather than others. And um, sometimes you can see that um, very clearly, and other times you don't. But if you're in those geographic areas and someone was mentioning, well, how do you know the organization you're applying for a job in? Well, you should be checking out how the geography affects the approach that people take to the position women have in organizations. So I was a woman in Florida. And when I was um, ultimately given um, the opportunity to be the superintendent, I was, it was 2005. And um, I was the first superintendent in the, uh, in one of the top 10 largest districts in the country. So the first female to be able to break that ceiling. 
And the way that I did that, and I talk about it, as you pointed out, Tracy, um, this is something that when you've been in a superintendent's position and then in um, a commissioner's position, people very, very often ask you to come and, and speak about, well, how did you do this, right? Because it was breaking through. And um, there's a few tenants that I think are really important, and I've heard a number of them referred to here. Um, but first, first of all, I would say to every woman and man, but particularly every woman, work so hard at the job that you have that everyone knows that the next job they give you the opportunity to do, you'll do great. And it, you're creating, you're creating um, an image of yourself and the work that you can do. And that is a difficult thing in a male dominated organization. However, it is extremely important because people will see that everyone comes to you to get stuff done. Um, I, would, I would agree with Vi, the concept of relationships is extremely important and you develop relationships all the time that you are in a work environment, all the time you're in a school or in an organization and treating people that um, are not leaders, but possibly could be for the value that they are is, um, is a monumental push for all women to move forward. So they know they are worthy of your, your um, attention and the work that you can do and how they can help to be, to move that culture. And Sue, you talked about the importance of culture. I think an organization that has a culture of quality um, is, a, is a culture that supports women. But if you have a, if you have a quality, uh, a culture rather that um, is not based on the work that you've done, the quality of the work you've done, the, the commitment that you have, you very often have all sorts of reasons that people get opportunities um, and they really are not equitable. And so I think it's a really important thing. The other thing I often say to people is be relentless. If you think you know what you need to get done, then you've got to convince everyone else that's what needs to get done. And um, I would say to people, you get to a mountain, okay? You go around it, you go over it, you go through it, but you get to the other side of that mountain because there's always more and there's always challenges. And so that is developing your skills to really keep focused on the important things that'll get um, your organization moving where it needs to go. Um, the, point of, the point that was brought up though um, about how, um, how important mentors are. I think that um, I would say in my, in, in my experience that having a female mentor is extremely important and having a male mentor is extremely important because they bring different views, right? And, um, and sometimes you could be in a meeting and interacting with people, you walk out and you go to your male mentor and you say, okay, give me some feedback on that. And they will see differently. And actually that gives you insight as to how to interact to get where you wanna be. But that, that big issue of mentors, Everybody could be a mentor for you, whether they're male or female. You need to get people that want others to do well. And that is a quality of leadership that I think is extremely important and that we've all talked about. And the other thing that I've always told educators is you're going to apply for positions. You're going to go to interviews and you aren't going to get them. And sometimes you're going to know it's because you're a woman or it's because you're an African-American woman or because um, there is not gender equality and you didn't get it because of that. Um, here's what I always tell people. You can get upset about it for about five, six hours. Then turn around and act as though it never happened because that tells people that you are able to move through challenges. And ultimately when that happens, 
men don't do that, guys. Men don't easily move away from the times that they've been told they couldn't have a position and somebody else got it. And I think we as women need to be very focused on showing the kind of behavior that is really the best for the organization and moving forward. So um, when you're thinking about all of these things, um, how, how you do them is really setting the stage. And as you know, uh, those of you, you've all had experiences in being a teacher you know, maybe not a formal teacher in a classroom, but a teacher. What you wanna do is be a great model. And you want people, the way you behave and the way you handle challenges and difficulties and, um, and clear times when people are discriminating against you because you are a woman, you want other people to see what's the best way to handle that and to do it well. And so, we all should be mentors for everyone that works with us. And we should attempt to move the organization forward because that's best for everyone. And in the end, then people will judge you for being the person you are, regardless of male or female, the person you are and you'll have opportunities. And that's how my career has gone. When I had the opportunity to become a commissioner in New York state, um, again, I was the first female um, to ever hold the position of commissioner in New York State. And um, people were shocked, right? Well, it just so happened that I had all the pieces that they were looking for. And it was a challenge, yes. Um, I love New York. I can say to you, it continues to be a challenge in New York, but we as, um, as a state have really moved that agenda. So one of the states that actually has had the greatest increase in the number of female leaders is New York State. So we're, as a state, very proud of that. So I am uh, thrilled to be on this panel with all of you. It's clear the agenda that you have is to further the opportunities for women in all of your fields. And I, um, I envy the opportunities that I think you'll all bring to those organizations. Thanks, Mary Ellen. I'd like to tap into your experiences. Um, we have a question from the audience, and I, I think you know you just you just talked about um, opportunities for advancement and opportunities to expand the workforce. But as the movement, as as you just as you discussed earlier, you talked about the movement is upwards. However, the numbers seem to decrease. Is this something that is caused by burnout? Uh, self-selection um, by choice, choosing something else, a different career path. I mean, what seems to be causing, as much as we're trying to expand opportunities for women, what's, what's some of the things that are causing them to maybe not take those opportunities? Well, so I think that is really um, a role that um, program, mentorship programs for um women particularly can fill the void. So one of the things that I found um, in, in New York, particularly uh, where the American um, Association of School um, Administrators, AASA, it's a superintendent's organization nationally, several years ago, they realized this, this void that existed when you looked at the statistics for um, leadership in education. And much of it was that it was such a strong um, past practice to put men in positions that women didn't feel they were qualified, even though many of them had been very successful principals and in, the, in a district organization had moved up into a district level position, they still didn't feel that way because the stronghold that was so uh, intense on who should get which jobs 
and who should apply for which jobs. And so you found that many women didn't feel like even though their resume was clear that they had those characteristics that would lead them to be able to lead, they didn't feel that they were they would be able to be successful. And so um, AASA and the local organization in New York started um, programming there specifically to address this issue. And they have really made incredible strides, but women have to want to put themselves out there and be leaders. And remember, many women are, um, as, as Aaron pointed out, they're intensely involved in what's going on in their home and they have children to raise. And one of the things that is difficult is being able to split those responsibilities and be successful in all. And you certainly, an, an, edu an educator doesn't want to give up the important years that their children has. And so they've got to be able to figure out how to balance that life. And it's very difficult. And so that's why I think you have women who haven't applied in the past, but more and more or programs that support their applications and give them the um, tools that they need to organize their thoughts around it, expand their, um, their experiences so that they can go into an interview and talk about the things that they've done. That is, I think, a really critical piece of it. But you're right, a lot of women have not, especially in education, have not moved that agenda. And I think that's, a, that's probably true across many occupations, right? The perception is it should be a male, and we as women have for too long thought we should go along with it. Sue, you wanna jump in? Yeah, just, um, just quickly, um, Mary Ellen, I, I totally ag agree with some of the things that you said just about how women sometimes just sort of remove them from those opportunities before they even, even get them. And Sheryl Sandberg talks a lot about that in her book, yes. you know, Lean In, right? Which yes. until I read that book, I thought, oh God, like I didn't even think about that because, you know, I don't personally have children. And so I haven't really maybe face some of those decisions that someone's, you know, a woman might say, oh, I'm not going to apply for that job because we're planning on having children or because I'm planning on getting married. And so sometimes people just sort of remove themselves from those opportunities um, for an event in the future that may or may not happen. And so they just don't even bother to apply. So I think, as she would say, lean in, get yourself into the table, apply for that job and deal with some of those other life decisions as they come. So I think number that's like one, just put yourself in there. And then two, you know, for at least for in my profession, I think you have to be very, very flexible. At the end of the day, if your goal is to be the head athletic trainer for an NFL team, but you don't want to leave Buffalo, there's only one job. And so I don't care what gender you identify as. It's a really hard one job to get. Like one person has that job. Yeah. So if you want to sort of work in some of these um, specific areas, you've got to be willing to kind of uproot your life a little bit, which is really difficult. I'm not saying that that's an easy thing to do. Um, but the amount of times I've moved or bought a new house and then or a brand new car and then left for six months or, you know, whatever it may be, I mean, are, are countless, but the opportunity sometimes takes me to different places versus me sitting in my one little spot in Phoenix and waiting for the opportunity to come to me. Sometimes I've got to go to the opportunity and we need to be open to that as men or women. Um, so I, I think that's also difficult for people to do inherently. You know, the interesting thing about that is Sue, that as more women are taking positions and have children or have other responsibilities or are willing to move and do all, they're seeing that that can happen and be you can be successful. And I think that's really, that's modeling what needs to be the attitude that people should um, work through. Thank you all very much. The, um, you know, kind of going back a little bit further to uh, some of T Tiffany's comments with Mary Ellen was uh, about, you know, rules, uh, about, you know, positions and, and the rules that kind of dictate, um, you know, who applies or who gets involved or whose responsibility is to do what when it comes to, you know, raising people up. But they say that access to power and money enact the ability to address these, these need to change. And I'm just curious, 
you know, Vi, what ways do you think women can work to create equity for themselves and other women coming up? Get rid of the room, so to speak. That's right. And I would say this much. A lot of it is all made up, right? And so we have to, it's all made up, guys. We can make a choice and exercise the power and influence that we have. Everyone has unique skills, talents, gifts, and abilities that are only theirs, that only they can contribute um, to whatever cause they choose to put their time, effort, and energy to. Um, so in that regard, I think it is very easy um, to think about all the things that are holding us back. And I promise you there will be plenty of people out there that will actively tell you all the reasons that you can't do something. And what I would offer to everyone is don't be one of the people that tells yourself that you can't do something. Um, I think we all have to figure out where the access to resources are. Sometimes that may mean doing research. It might mean talking to other people, um, finding out if your employer pays for you to go back to school, um, what programs are out there that might allow you um, access to a path forward. Um, but I, to me, I would flatly say if, you know, our success is in our own hands, um, and we have to go after it. And so, um, you know, there, there are many ways to do that. But if I spent my career listening to all the time someone wanted to put me in a box or someone, you know, wanted to tell me, oh, well, you don't really want to do that, uh, I would be nowhere. You know, I, I would be nowhere fast. And so I think um, having confidence and belief in yourself, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think really um, a stubborn belief in yourself is what I would honestly say. Uh, but I think access to power, access to funds, to me, those are things that we tell ourselves as to why we can't do something. Oh, I can't do it because I don't have this or I don't have that. And what I will offer to people is split that on its head. If that's what you think you need to move forward, make a plan to go out there. Who, who are the people who have the power that I need to talk to? What is a way that I can get funding? Can I look into scholarships? Is my employer gonna help me pay for this? Are there programs out there um, you know, that would help someone like me move forward because my income level is X, Y, Z? Um, so we have to recognize, not only take advantage of, but we have to recognize the opportunities that are there. And, um, and really, you know, you have to have some resilience too, which I think as women, we all have in spades, um, but you have to have some resilience because people are going to not be encouraging sometimes, right? Some people are going to be downright actively discouraging to you. And some of those people might be in your family. And so there may be barriers that you have to overcome, conversations that you have to have. You know, Erin, when you were talking about the dichotomy between responsibility division of men and women at home, you know, I found myself immediately thinking, like, I would make a request of my husband. I didn't make this child alone. I didn't buy this house alone. This is not a 50-50 partnership, this is a 100-100 partnership or whoever your spouse is, if you have one. You know, but who are, who are the people that you can lean on to help you? Um, you know, and, and really kind of figuring out how you create bandwidth and space for yourself to move into opportunity. I think so many of us, have so many things going on and we stay in this kind of circle of survival, right? And we really need to move into a circle of possibility. And what are the possibilities that stand before us? Um, but you know, the future isn't created yet. And so we have an opportunity to create it. We control a great number of things. And if we would just recognize and exercise the power of the things that we do control, um, I think we have an opportunity to move far, but you know, 
to everyone out there, I would say, be a barrier buster. Like, don't create those barriers in your mind. Kick those suckers down. I like it. Mary Ellen, did you want to jump in? Just want to... I just want to underscore what um, Vi said. You know, you're going to have people tell you you can't do something because their perception is based on who may have done it before, um, maybe perceptions that um, women shouldn't be in certain jobs. There are people out there that obviously we know still believe that. And I think what you need to do and what I would tell um, anyone that I was mentoring is uh, concentrate on the people that are supporting you to do what you know you can do, not the ones that are telling you you can't do it. I mean, it really is a matter of focusing on the positives. And listen, everybody's going to have some things happen that are um, not what you would put on what you'd want to put on your resume. those challenges, it's how you get through them and how you are successful and how you can move the agenda forward. That really is what makes it. I think it's great. I, I have to underscore the whole idea that you have to take control of this yourself. You have to be in control. You have to take charge. Um, that is one thing that I spoke, I speak to a lot of, a lot of students um, that are interested in being in college athletics is no one's going to walk up to you and say, hey, you want this job? You have to go and get it. And if you, you just, you have to fight for it and you have to um, do the best that you, and then when you get the job, do the best that you can and then go after the next one. It, it's, you cannot stand still. It's, yes, more opportunities are coming about. So yes, you will have the op opportunities, but in order to get it, you have to work for it. You have to make that effort. You know? So I'm going to kind of go into our next question. And that was an incredible, it was a great discussion. Thank you all very, very much. Got me all wrapped up again. Um, just re replaying how I got to where I am today. Um, uh, but, you know, I want to kind of bring another metaphor back into, into play here. Um, talking about the glass cliff. Uh, you know, they use it to describe the disproportionate amount, uh, number of women um, times that women are put into difficult leadership positions. You know, women who achieve such positions of power face greater risk and criticism from their stakeholders, often with less collegial support. Um, Adragisa, how might this be managed? Thanks for this challenging question. And also, I feel incredibly inspired after all of your interventions. I do have to lead in my response with just how humbled I am to be on a panel with you, Mary Ellen, and others who have um, on an intergenerational panel, which is a concept that I'm working with in terms of um, the work that I do with empowering adolescent girls to come and speak and address decision makers directly at the UN. Right now I'm organizing a ministerial level event where girls will be questioning and sharing their recommendations and lived experiences with a number of ministers during CSW. So um, several things that I'm thinking about is just this sort of, you know, I had to actually look up the metaphor to be completely transparent with the audience. I hope that that's a sign of my, perhaps my generation and the fact that, you know, what I'm hoping to see, and, you know, it's really difficult for me to, to speak about this because I'm, again, surrounded in a, by feminists, working with feminists in a nurturing environment where we all have a common agenda. And, you know, um, how, do we, how do we think about creating enabling environments where we do have that, that sort of exchange about and, and, and profile the diversity of different experiences across the life spectrum of every woman and girl, right? Um, and so I think my generation and younger generations more so I, are more hyper aware of their gender, gender identity, of their other identities. Um, and I, I don't know if there's a little bit of a paradigm shift happening. Hopefully it is to where we don't really see things, you know, we, we're just sort of existing in the spaces that we're in without really considering those um, 
metaphors or barriers, if that makes if that makes sense. You did also touch on something that really hits a nerve with me in my advocacy now. A lot of the discussions that we have in the gender equality um, space are around how men and boys reinforce um, and support women and girls towards achieving, you know, breaking these barriers and, and towards us collectively working um, on achieving gender equality. And so I keep uh, reminding that there is a reason why we're still talking about girls, for instance, as a group of marginalized, you know, stakeholders who need who need to be elevated um, in that way. And that, of course, men and boys also suffer from similar consequences of, you know, gender based violence and so on. If you're talking about conflicts, for instance, um, but I, I feel like that conversation is a really dangerous trap to fall into. And honestly, I never thought about getting a male mentor. I guess I've just, you know, I come from, from Bosnia. <laughs> I'm thinking about where did I see my first sort of role modeling um, and in, in having grown up with strong female personalities in my family who I, I guess just naturally, um, been inclined to follow and then in my career as I said I'm surrounded with with female leaders so so um yeah that's a really interesting idea to to think about um a couple of another thing that I wanted to reflect on in addition to this pet peeve that I have around um, the men and boys thing <laughs> is just the idea of of culture but in a different sense so for us you know I'm I spend all of my energy in, in creating um, change through first step of policy uh, policy making, right? So until we uh, domesticate international laws and, and you know, really uh, push societies to um, address this in a, in a legal sense, uh, we, we won't address these inequalities in a cultural sense. And it's really the norms uh, and negative attitudes that we need to combat at the root of all of this that we're talking about, which is the most challenging work that we do in, in my sphere, at least. So um, tackling those negative norms in addition to changing policies is really crucial and um, and worthwhile for us to keep to keep investing in. So um, I guess I will I will stop there. I'm not sure how to answer. The question, when I looked up the definition of glass cliff, it's that women are elevated to positions of power when things are going poorly and their risk of failure is heightened before knowing the term. So, 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 you know, it makes sense, perhaps, that if we have fewer opportunities as women or minorities to rise to positions of power, and those are the more challenging ones that get presented to us, we're more likely to jump on them. Um, I'm, I'm sure that experts who have done research around this would have would have recommendations on how how to address it. But for me, the first intuitive thing that I think about is creating that environment again that's uh, nurturing, enabling, and empowering for women and girls to really see a broader spectrum of options than just those challenging few jobs that we might be invited to, to apply to and really shift, uh, as someone was saying, our mindset around, around what those opportunities mean. So I hope all of that um, made sense. Thank you. It did. Ragisa, thank you so much. I'm actually going to kind of tie this into a little another question. You know, we've just experienced an entire year of uncertainty that is second to none in 100 years of society. And there's been some discussions and some reports out there that, you know, women have been thrust into certain positions, um, governors, um, chairs of various committees that are dealing with the different um, issues that are going around the nation right now. And I guess there's some question is, does this impact women in leadership? Does their success or failure going to make an impact on how in the future people see women in leadership? Erin, what do you think? 
Well, <laughs> um, I think something that's really interesting is, you know, like we've all discussed on, on the panel, um, a mantra that comes to mind to me often is a Gloria Steinem quote that's called, dreaming is a form of planning. And I think like we've all discussed, in order for us to kind of envision this world that we want to be in, we have to dream it a bit and we have to imagine it. And, you know, like Mary Ellen and Vi and Tiffany were all saying that this is, sometimes those opportunities are not presented. Sometimes we have to be resilient in moving forward for what we want. Um, and sometimes we also have to kind of in moving forward, be my, extra mindful of who we're bringing up behind us. Um, and I think something that would be, I would love to set the intention for during this panel is, you know, maybe all of us can, you know, make an ask or put forth some advocacy towards a woman um, or a special person in our life that we feel like maybe hasn't really raised their voice in a while. Um, I think even the audience could participate in this today um, and really just bring forth some kind of great energy and check in on them, see if they need anything. Um, what can we do right now in this moment to really uplift either the next generation or somebody that we think needs a little bit of a push? Amen. Absolutely. I'm all in. What about you, Vi? What would you like to add? I just wanted to say, listening to uh, Jagitza and, and Aaron, it really just made me think that um, for those of us who are in leadership positions, um, and I should have said this earlier, it is so important that from a pay equity standpoint that we make it absolutely non-negotiable when we're hiring people that we see what a market assessment is, a fair market value for that job, and also what the internal equity is so that we can see everyone that's in a current role and that we make sure that um, people that we're bringing along are paid fairly. And, um, you know, Aaron, I just agree with everything that you just said. There's always something that we can do right now to inspire and uplift others, whether it's nominating them for award, reaching out to them for a cup of coffee, or just doing a check-in. Um, there are lots of things that we can do to build others. Thank you very, very much. You know, Tiffany, can you, can you kind of uh, take a look at, you know, how we were just discussing um, uh, the impact and women in leadership and, and maybe kind of touch on before we close out today, uh, the unconscious gender bias piece. Um, it still remains a barrier uh, to career advancement. And it, it, I, I really think that we need to touch on it uh, with our audience um, to deal. And so how do you, how do societal gender roles and the use of stereotypical language perpetuate gender bias? And, and how can we grow from that too? We, we've, we've talked about moving forward in progress. So let's keep going forward. Yeah, I like forward. Sure. Um, I think we all can agree that language is really important, right? And that um, words that we use um, uh, can have long standing impact on people's lives. Um, and what's even more important, I think, is how we examine um, how language perpetu perpetuates stereotype roles and how we can create, how it also can create preconceived notions about how people should perform and how, how we should exist, right? Um, so let me give you a couple examples. One example is um, kind of a social example. Um, I'm a mom, I have two kids, um, and I do have a partner as well. Um, when women say, I need a break, right? It's often viewed as um, bad parenting, um, impatience with your own children, kind of an ungrateful um, uh, response to, um, a role that you you accepted, you know, willingly, right? You had those kids, um, they're yours. Uh, how could you want to be away from them? Um, usually those are folks who don't have any kids who don't get that. But, um, but conversely, men, um, men are kind of applauded for being able to really construct those boundaries, right? Between their work and their families. Um, it, it's, it's almost um, an allowable thing, right? That, that those boundaries can exist. Um, but it's so much more challenging for women um, to, to advocate for their needs. 
Um, another example, this is uh, kind of a, a, um, a pop culture reference, but this morning I found a really quick um, TikTok of Nicki Minaj talking to a gentleman about ego. And she was really upset with him because um, he was critical of the fact that she was proud of herself and that she was, you know, you know, we can coin ourselves, you know, bosses. And so he was very critical of the fact that she was proud of her accomplishments and how she has branded herself as a successful businesswoman and an artist and a creative and now a parent. Um, but men don't get the, that kind of critique when in terms of being proud of their accomplishments, right? Sometimes women who can boast about all that they've done um, are, are considered to be maybe too big for their britches now, right? Things like that. So um, I think it is really important um, to, to, to realize that it, it's, the, it's the same um, in our workplaces. There's um, gendered and socially constructed ideals about our roles, right? Um, and language that upholds those longstanding ideals of gender place and position creates barriers that require the marginalized to work X amount, X times harder to be seen and acknowledged as capable and integral. So um, we need to make sure that we're understanding how qualifying our abilities based on gendered language um, allows this gap to continue to exist. And even more so, it gives it permission for inequitable treatment of people. Um, so, so much important for us to be acknowledgeable about um, how we use words and how we attach meaning to words, um, examining um, historical context of language um, is really important in conversations as well. Um, we have to be very careful and mindful and thoughtful and progressive in um, how we use language um, to define individuals. Thanks, Tiffany. I'm gonna catch all of you off guard. I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna call on you. Give me a takeaway from today, from our discussion. Uh, a, a good takeaway that to, for our um, audience to kind of uh, remember. Vi? So I think there's a lot of powerful women on this panel. Um, <laughs> and I think uh, it's been so enjoyable. But I think the one takeaway that we've all kind of talked about is, um, you know, embracing your power and, um, and move forward. Don't be a barrier to yourself is what I would say is a key takeaway. Thank you. Erin? I love this idea of focusing on opportunity instead of survival. I think a lot of us, um, where I can speak for myself personally, I feel like I've been in survival mode um, every day. <laughs> and um, I think oftentimes we forget that power. We forget that spark that we have. You know, the spring is coming. Um, things are always changing. And so I think it's definitely an excellent reminder to ground ourselves in, in what could be in the magic of that. So I'm appreciative for, for hearing that and for hearing all your stories today. Thank you. Sue? Gosh, there's so many great takeaways. It's hard to pick one. Um, you know, I think I, I will will just sort of, it hasn't been said exactly this way, but we've all been saying it. You know, I think that people have said to me in the past that I've been lucky with some of my job offers. And, you know, I think we could all have even a longer discussion about the opportunities we didn't get, let alone the opportunities we have gotten. Um, and so, you know, I think luck is, as, as the saying goes, luck is when opportunity meets preparedness. And I have been extremely lucky because I have been prepared when the opportunities then presented it presented to me. And so I think when we think about the concept of controlling our controllables, which we, I talk a lot about with the athletes and clients that I work with, and they've really taught me, you can only control what you can control. And so sometimes when things get so out of control, which they have been for the last year, what are the things that we can control? What are the things that we can do? I can control how prepared I am for when an opportunity comes up. And so I, I, I would think that control your controllable, control your controllables um, and be prepared for when those opportunities come. Thank you. Mary Ellen, a quick takeaway. Yeah, I, I would say um, an important thing for all of us is, and, and we're all on the same page, we all have this agenda 
uh, to support women in moving forward, whatever forward is to them, but moving forward, I think we, um, we need to make sure that when we're in settings where we things that see things that are negative, that in a very careful way, we call it out. However that is, however we can make sure that, um, that we're supporting other women so that they have great opportunities. Tiffany? Um, I agree with everyone. I think this panel has offered tremendous um, insight into um, where we go, how we move forward. I think um, for me in the work that I do, um, it would what I've learned here is that it is just so much more important to be considerate of the marginalized and that the glass ceiling is often double and triple paned for some people so that it's not as, it's not as simple as reaching the top um, and cracking it wide open and that it's responsibility of those who've been able to um, get ourselves to a position of power um, and privilege to um, to examine those those double pane to triple pane walls and doors um, and floors uh, and make sure that we are working um, in, in, with our with great intention um, to to ensure that folks can can get to where we are and have those kind of opportunities as well. Great, Dragica, why don't you round us out? Wow. Lots of pressure. So I think someone in our audience might have asked about what are we doing for the women who come after us. I was just thinking about an instance of a 16 year old girl from Peru that I had um, hosted at the UN two years ago, who changed her municipal budget through advocacy at her school where she got a group of kids to to come up with the proposal and then lobby their local government. And, and when I had her in front of her government in New York, they were asking her, what do you do to support other girls, you know, to, to show them how, how to leave? She said, well, I just tell them it's simple. You just do it. You just, you just do it and you show them. So we cannot underestimate the power of putting ourselves, giving a face to the things that we're talking about. And, and it's just being in the space to me is empowering so I can recognize myself where I'm headed. Um, one other important thing for me personally is this idea of voice and agency, obviously. Uh, I'm in the business that I'm in for a reason. I've spent uh, most of my childhood in a, in a country that was affected by conflict with no control from my family um, over our lives. For a long time, I was a refugee and um, also felt quite powerless uh, in, for many years, even in education systems that I was in. So I've really been, I've, I've spent a lot of my life seeking that voice and that agency. And, and you cannot, you, you can have that inherent to who you are and, and arise from your experience, but you need others to help you, you know, express, express that voice. And, and like I was saying, enable, enable that and empower you. So that's, so empowerment, authenticity, voice, and, and gratitude. Thank you so much for including me today. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. My takeaway is that I have five new mentors and five new colleagues that I am so excited to have been able to work with today. Thank you to our panelists and everyone who has made this panel possible. Thank you for your time today. Thank you to our sponsor, the graduate programs at Damon College. Uh, please, for more information about Damon College, please check out www.damon.edu. Keep your eyes peeled for more virtual events coming soon. Thank you so much for joining us and go Wildcats. At Damon College, we understand your college journey may be different this year and we make it easy. With no SAT or ACT required, four year tuition guarantee for students who apply early decision and holistic admissions reviews, the application process is simple. Plus, Damon offers over 65 undergraduate majors and programs, so there's something for just about everyone. Not to mention, our athletics program is Western New York's premier Division II team. Visit damon.edu admissions to get started.
At Damon College, we understand your college journey may be different this year, and we make it easy. With no SAT or ACT required, four-year tuition guarantee for students who apply early decision, and holistic admissions reviews, the application process is simple. Plus, Damon offers over 65 undergraduate majors and programs, so there's something for just about everyone. Not to mention, our athletics program is Western New York's premier Division II team. Visit damon.edu slash admissions to get started. At Damon College, we understand your college journey may be different this year, and we make it easy. With no SAT or ACT required, four-year tuition guarantee for students who apply early decision, and holistic admissions reviews, the application process is simple. Plus, Damon offers over 65 undergraduate majors and programs, so there's something for just about everyone. Not to mention, our athletics program is Western New York's premier Division II team. Visit damon.edu slash admissions to get started. At Damon College, we understand your college journey may be different this year, and we make it easy. With no SAT or ACT required, four-year tuition guarantee for students who apply early decision, and holistic admissions reviews, the application process is simple. Plus, Damon offers over 65 undergraduate majors and programs, so there's something for